Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. And all that's going to make a little more sense here as we move forward today on a communion Sunday. So hopefully you've got your packets. There'll be an opportunity for you to get one if you, if you don't. I'm asking, keep this sealed for now. Hold on to it. You're going to get instructions, but it's going to be really important as we move forward towards the end of my message, what we're going to do in communion. So just keep that sealed. It's so good to be with you today. I give honor to this body of believers, Pastor Mike, Pastor Cindy, uh, the staff, do you know I climbed a mountain just a couple of weeks ago with Pastor Joshua in Washington, so it's kind of cool. He came and visited. Yeah, it was really awesome. Uh, he crushed it. I was doing all I could to keep up with him, so it was awesome, man. It is so good to be with you all. We kicked off an incredible series last week. Pastor Mike kicked off Whatever is Good. How many of you believe that it's really important that we keep our mind focused on what God says about reality instead of what everybody else says about reality? Amen. We want the word to be the way in which we see the world. And we want to keep our mind on whatever is good. And that series kicked off last week. And we're going to be digging in today into another thing that we want to keep our mind on, right? We want to keep our heart and mind focused on communion. And communion is, is not just wafer and wine, bread and cup. Yes, it absolutely represents this. But these elements are actually telling us something about the reality that Jesus has given us and has revealed to us. Communion is not just something we do at church, but this is something that reminds us of a reality of communion that goes on every single day in the life of a believer. Do you believe that? Amen. That's why we need each other. We're a body. And so we're going to explore here for just the next few minutes a concept and something I'm afraid we might be losing a bit in the modern world. We might be losing a little bit in the modern church, but it's this Greek word called koinonia. Koinonia, this word. Can you, can you try to say that? Because I'm probably, I mean, I'm, I'm from Texas. We don't talk good down there. So koinonia, right? Say it. Tell someone, nudge them and say koinonia. Koino koinonia. Koinonia. This Greek word often translated, say it with me, fellowship. Fellowship, this, this gathering together, this getting along, this being a group of people. And, and I really warned myself, but I got to give you a little bit, I got, cause I, I wanna, I got so, so many things I want to do here in the next few minutes, I don't want to get too caught up here, but I am passionate about cautioning the hyper-individualism of our day hyper-individualism. Thank God for our Bill of Rights. Thank God for our Constitution. Thank God for our country, the goods of our freedom. Do you know that thing, that American Constitution, it identified something that hadn't really been identified in human history is that there's some individual rights. That's awesome. I'm all for that. But out of that reality in our culture, we have leaned so far towards the me and the I that we're losing our human collectivist roots. Now some of you, your cultures are rich and beautiful and they come from a collective heritage. Now notice, do not hear communism and all that garbage. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about humans who know how to be a people instead of just a celebrity superstar person. That's what I'm getting at. Our Bible, every single scripture, is written in a collectivist consciousness. There was no such thing as an individualist culture when the Bible was written. You tracking with me? Let's not. What, what's your point, Royce? Well, I'm so glad you asked. My point is this. We can't lose the ability to be a body and a people and a family and an us. We can never sacrifice the us that Jesus died for so that we get the me that Jesus died for. It's both. He died for you and he died for me, but he died for us. Not just so that you could be saved, but so we could be saved. You see, and listen, amen. I'll take the gratuitous preacher claps. I love those, amen. Sometimes I'll even amen myself if I feel like it's good enough, you know? 
I'm so glad, I'm so glad to share this with you today. Jesus saved you and Jesus saved me, but if we aren't careful, we can become a room that's nothing more than a collection of transformed individuals who really still don't know how to be a people. Now, I'm not going to solve all that today, but I want to encourage it. I want to exhort to you that Jesus wants us to be a people. And I would argue today the one thing the world is aching for is could you show us how to get along? Could you show us how to be family again? Could you show us how to be a people again? The Lord wants to use his church. One of the ways we could preach the gospel loud and clear, and you know what? The world will pay attention is when we show them how to be a people again. That in one house, people could vote Democratic or they could vote Republican or they could vote Independent or they maybe could not vote at all because of conscience. Well, I just lost somebody right there. It's possible. <laughs> and we still love each other and we have respectful communication, and we still see the blood of Jesus flowing through us. We still maintain unity, why? Because we are unified on something bigger than the smaller things. We realize we're a part of something greater than what the world divides over. All right, I gotta keep going. This is so good to get to share today. Koinonia, right? Can you bring that word back up for us today? Koinonia. And if you want to call it koinonia, it's fine. We're not going to get tested on this. You're not going to be graded or judged. I mean, that's what I'm preaching about, right? If you want to say koinonia, koinonia, kononakania, whatever you want to call it, it's all right. We're glad to be together today. But this word, what does it mean? Communion by intimate participation. Koinonia means communion by intimate participation. Do you know you can't be just a consumer if you want koinonia? This is the word that's used for fellowship. This is what Jesus is pointing his people toward at the very end when he's bringing the communion elements in, when they're having that Seder feast together. He is talking to them not just as a collection of individuals, he's talking to them as a new kind of family, a new kind of fellowship, a new kind of people. And that people are defined by communion, by intimate participation. Now, another way that some scholars frame koinonia is intimate joint participation with others. Intimate joint participation with others. So you can't just consume, you got to get involved. Now do this for me, nudge the person next to you and say, man, we need you in the game. I know, that's funny. It's like, <laughs> some of y'all are like, well, that's a little judgy. Well, we're just having fun, right? We're having fun. We need you in the game. And that's funny, you know, some Christians are like, mm-hmm, that's prophetic, Royce. That's prophetic right there. I've been, I've been needing to tell my neighbor that for some time. Well, that's what we get with hyper-individualism. My needs, my needs, my needs, my needs. What am I going to get out of this? What's in it for me? And church can die if the church feels that's, the, that's how they have to address and meet the people. Now, I want to add value to you today, but I think the greatest way I could add value to you is not only try to meet your needs, but call you into need meeting reality yourself. That you're more than just a consumer. You're also a producer. You're more than just a spectator. It's okay, sometimes it's good to just watch and see what's going on and see what God's telling you. Nothing wrong with that. But I don't wanna stay there forever. I don't want my relationship to be with God as something that I just come and sit inert and watch other pro-Christians. I meant that more snarky than it come out. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, but it's like, now, there is no such thing as pro-Christians who've got it all figured out, right? These superstar celebrity personalities. No, 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 no. It's the body of Jesus Christ, and every one of us have a place to participate. Do you remember that beautiful song that we heard, uh, the second song in the worship set that was so beautiful? In my Father's house, there's a place 
for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. That's not something you consume alone. That's something you participate in. Wow, I feel the Holy Spirit right now wanting me to tell somebody, no matter where you are today, you might think I'm, I'm, I'm not in a place, Royce, to where I could be used of God. Don't say that. You absolutely are. Your story, where you've been, your journey, what God's done for you up until this point, you have no idea. And it's the enemy's business to try and cheat you out of what God wants to do through you by lowering your sense of identity. That all you could ever do is let the pros, come on, I'm wink, wink, you know. The pros do the ministry when God's saying, no, 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 you are ministry. Shift your mindset from spectating to participating. Shift your mindset to say, I want in on what God is doing in the world. Can I ask you a question? Is there anyone here that you believe the Lord has invited all of his people to participate in what he's doing? Is there anyone left out? Come on, we need you in the game. We want you in. And so what I want, everyone imagine a cross with me today. And if you don't know what a cross is, is designed after, right? This is what crosses are made for, people. And Jesus tells us to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and quite literally, you're like, where's my cross? Well, it could be you. <laughs> I, I'm my cross to some degree, is picking up my life and saying, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. With a cross, you have a vertical beam and you have a horizontal beam. So I wanna work on that metaphor for just a moment that every cross is gonna have a vertical. Let's just connect that, me and God. Everyone say, you, me and God. But what about me and each other? Come on, this is our reality, right? Some of you are on fire in the vertical, but if you leave it vertical, you're slipping into the hyper-individualism that makes us a collection of just singles who don't know how, and singles meaning individuals, who don't know how to get along with the rest of the body, who don't understand their place in a body, who don't understand their place in a family. I love it. Is there some people that's got some, do you love your family today? Not just your spiritual family, your blood family. Do you love your family today? Do you know how much more Jesus wants us to appreciate our spiritual family? The body that Jesus died for. And this is what I'm getting at. Is there some people who love God in the house today? Amen. Amen. This is what I believe the Lord wants to say to us through koinonia today. Be as committed to each other as we are to Jesus. Be as committed to each other as we are to Jesus. This is the heart of fellowship. This is what God is calling us to. So let's get into the word of the Lord and just read scripture and see the foundation of koinonia. Acts chapter number two, verse number 42. This is such a beautiful passage of scripture. And I'm not afraid to tell you, I've shared this with people that this is a reality of following Jesus. And I can't tell you the preachers over the years, the saints over the years, the people of God over the years who are like, oh, that's a nice scripture, but it's unrealistic. Is it? Is it unrealistic what we're about to read? And I want you to think about this. Is this so far, or are we missing something in our understanding of fellowship? Do we have the vertical beam, but we've not really put much emphasis on the horizontal? We want the me and God because we can consume all the good gifts that God gives us, but we have no time for each other. You see, this, this is the breakdown, and boy, the Holy Spirit's hitting me. I just want to throw this out here for a few people who've ever wondered why in the modern world or maybe here in the West, miracles happen, but they seem to be more scarce to come by than other places in the world where miracles happen like this. I want to tell you it has everything to do with the lack of fellowship. Miraculous power moves through koinonia. And if koinonia is anemic or scarce, the power of God, he will move because God's able to overcome our deficiencies. But it's not a thriving environment like a circuit. 
If the circuit's not made, the power stops where the circuit's broken. God wants us to put, and this isn't hard work in the sense of something you got to do. It's an open heart posture that says, Lord, I want vertical connection and I want horizontal connection. I want a body and I don't want to be isolated. And I know some of you are like, well, how do you do that? Just simply say yes. Yes. And it's not all these techniques that we got to do. We're going to get in this, but I'm just a little ahead of myself today, letting the Holy Spirit encourage us. God wants to do something in his body today and in the world. So let's look at the word of the Lord. Acts chapter number two. This is the early church. This is shortly after uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the, the profound things that God did on the birthday of the church. Let's look at this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to koinonia. That's fellowship there. That's the Greek, koinonia. So that's where, are you devoted to the koinonia? See, that's the question. I know I'm pushing a little bit here today, but it's because I love you, right? Every preacher says that. Push, push, push. Are we devoted? Some of us are devoted to God, but we're not devoted to his big idea of what it means to be a people. We might have to surrender some of our hyper-individualism. I didn't say your unique distinction, your unique expression that God has given you. No, 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 no. But a university where we get to be diverse, unique, distinct, different stories, different cultures, different language, different heritage, right? Beautiful. But we know how to come together and be one people within that university. We didn't lose our diversity, but we got something even bigger than our diversity that pulls us together. Somebody say the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Man, I'm gonna preach myself out of time here, but it just feels good. Do you know what? I heard an old preacher ask me something. I was raised Pentecostal, okay? Where when we went to church, it was crazy. Like I feared for my life growing up in church. Bobby pins, do you remember what those things were? That's like ammunition in a war zone. They were flying everywhere. I remember being a kid up under the pew, just hiding and keeping my hands like this because high heels was like, ah! And I was like, it was like a house of horrors growing up in the church I grew up in. I was like, God. I mean, I got saved asking the Lord to protect me from people who were worshiping like crazy. Jesus, if you'll protect me, I'll serve you all my life, Lord, please. Just trying to sleep under the pew as a little kid. But I heard an old preacher say it like this. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit filled the house. There was 120 believers that were left after about 10 days, 7 to 10 days. And they are there, and they are waiting on the promise of the Father. And guess what? It said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together, together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy, I want to tell you how I was raised, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't know about the Holy Spirit. They were filled with, you got to, if you don't get that joke, you weren't raised like me. (laughs) But some people laugh, and they know what I'm talking about. It was the Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. They both are the same, but it was a good joke. And they were filled with the Spirit. And I had an elder pull me aside. And I'm so thankful for this elder in my life. He said, Royce, what is the why of Pentecost? I said, well, to save us, equip us. He said, I'm like, tongues? He's like, Lord, help this boy. (laughs) I said, miracles. You know, I was like 18 years old, man. I didn't know anything. And I mean, he's asking me a tough question. What is the why? When this hits, I believe, I pray that it hits you as hard as it hit me if you've never considered this. And I'm going through the the Acts chapter two, fire, wind, unity. I'm trying all these different things and he's like, you're getting close, you're getting warmer. He said, but that's the what of Pentecost. Acts two is the manifestation of the why. Well, I'm like, well, where's the why? He said, you gotta go back to Joel to get the why. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit, watch it, watch it, on all flesh. And some of you are like, Royce, you're really excited and I ain't getting it. Well, you're going to get it. You just got to let me have a moment with you. All flesh. I'm a little worked up right now. All flesh 
Watch this, sons and daughters, old and young. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He said handmaidens and servants. What do we have? Economic unity. There was economic segregation, but he said my Holy Spirit doesn't stop at a bank account level. Male and female, both get my spirit. Old and young, both get my spirit. Ethnicity, all get my spirit. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, what I'm telling you, the why of Pentecost is global unity. What this world is hoping for in world peace comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, you know what? He gives us a unified language in the Spirit even. That's restoring what was lost at Babel is restored in an upper room in Acts chapter 2 so that we can begin to communicate in a frequency that brings us together. You know what? Let's just have a moment here. I got, I got a couple more minutes with you. Would you pray with me right now and just say, Lord, I want your spirit to move through me in such a way that it unifies me with my brothers and sisters like never before. Lord, your spirit isn't just for me, it's for us. A little more right here. It isn't just for me, it's for us. It's for us. I gotta read this scripture to you. The word of God is so important. He said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to koinonia. We gotta devote ourselves to this. Which means, I don't, I don't agree with them. Okay, I get it, I get it, but are they in the body of Christ? Did Jesus die for them? We need bonds. This is how we would say it at Story Church. Because of koinonia, disagreement will never lead to our divorce. In a hyper-individualistic culture, the moment we disagree, we have a threat alert that goes off. We're like, danger, out. The Lord's like, no, 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 that's shallow. That's not Holy Spirit living. It doesn't mean you have to immediately agree. It means you hold on and you find something deeper than the disagreement to connect with. There is something that you agree with. Get, get deeper. Get beneath it. I just feel a preach on me today. We got to hold on to each other. We need each other. And you know what? The world needs us to hold on to each other. Good preaching would be hold on to them, but we can't hold on to them if we can't hold on to each other. We're never going to hold on to a drowning world if we can't hold on to each other in the church. I need you. I need you. And you know what? You need me. And we need each other. And we need to devote ourselves to this beautiful thing that is created by the power of the Spirit called koinonia. It's fellowship. It's brotherly and sisterly bonds. It's living in the why of the Holy Spirit, not just the what. Come on, I know what it's like to go kind of crazy, charismatic, and crazy Pentecostal. That's because you prioritize the what over the why. And I love moves of God. Please do not misunderstand me. But the reason God gave you a move wasn't for you to walk home and go, wow, didn't we have church? It was for us to be a people stronger, more equipped, more together, more holding on to each other, more loving, more generous, more devoted. I'm out of time with where I want to be. I just want to, let's read this scripture again. Acts chapter number two and verse number 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. I can't, you see, I can't get past that first sentence. I'm trying, I'm trying. You got to pray for me. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Did you catch that? When koinonia and teaching are prioritized, fellowship and God's word lived out, miracles just naturally flow in an environment like that. If I only am vertical, the power of God doesn't have the course in the circuit to move to the same degree. And I've seen this my entire 31 years of ministry. When we connect to each other and to God, profound things begin to happen. But when we're just a room of individuals, 
sitting collected together for a message that we consume, the power is stunted in how much it can flow. The Holy Spirit, now God can do anything, but he has designed his people to be a body. And when we commit to that body, the Holy Spirit, the blood flows and profound things happen in our life. Now get this, the miracles flowed, all the believers were together, they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You think they agreed on every single idea? They weren't identical twins. Some of them came from different backgrounds, different... Jesus was bigger. I'm just... I, when I preach, I'm going to just go with the Holy Spirit, right? I got more word over here on these notes than I have time for, but the Holy Spirit's like, go over here. Let me tell you something. In the 12 disciples, there were two. One, Simon the Zealot, and then Matthew or Levi the tax collector. You may already know this, but this is kind of, this is, this is really interesting. Zealots were an ultra-nationalist group who believed what's wrong with Israel is that we haven't got fed up and cleaned house with all the compromisers and all the people who don't believe truth. And so what they, they got violent. The zealots were violent and they're like, we need to fight and take back our country. That was their, their attitude. There was a zealot on Team Jesus. Everybody, you tracking with me? This zealot likely either plotted or participated in assassinations or terrorist activities. Do you know the number one target of assassination for zealots? Tax collectors. Because they were the ultimate traitor to their people because they worked for the man, Rome, and served the man, Rome, and oppressed their fellow people. They were easy targets, and the zealots, and I know this could be a little crude, but they would just and they were, they were assassins. You know what I'm happy to tell you before we move into communion? We don't have one scripture that talks about an argument between Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector. We don't hear one campfire blow up or I'm going to another church, Matthew said. Oh, I just got real, didn't it? They never, I'm sure they disagreed. You wanna talk about some issues between each other. They couldn't be more opposite, more animosity, more historical hatred, more culturally ingrained mindsets than those two people. And you never hear about them fighting. Why? Jesus was bigger. That's your, that was your message right there. Jesus was bigger than their issues. And they found unity in the greatness of their Lord. You want to know, I can get along with you even when we don't seem to get along. Why? Because you like Jesus? Well, I kind of, I'm fond of him as well. Let's talk about that. Let's bond over that. I, I don't know if you feel what I'm feeling right now, and I'm not trying to get you to do something, but I believe this is a message for our day right now. This is a message going into an election where we're about to be pumped and further brainwashed to hate the other side. No, you can't make me hate the other side. Do I agree with their ideology? Maybe not. We need people who are trained by the Spirit to look for connection instead of validating disconnection at any turn. We shouldn't easily disconnect. We should work hard with the Spirit for connection. Would you get your elements out? Let's go to Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. I, I, I love doing communion, but I haven't read this scripture in communion in a long time. Keep it sealed, keep it sealed. It's going to be important. Yep, keep it sealed, keep it sealed. 
Just, but just get the packet out. I should have been more clear. And if you need a packet, they're passing them out now. Just raise your hand and they'll come to you. His body, his body, his blood is more than enough. It's more than enough to bring us together. Well, you know, I could preach, it's more than enough to save you. It's more than enough to heal you. It's more than enough to, yes, all true. But that would be just you. And where I want to be is yes, yes, yes to everything I just said and illustrated. But it's more than enough to help us get along. It's more than enough for us to have dignified, respectful dialogue in disagreement and not throw each other away because we don't see eye to eye on one tiny issue. Do you know a lot of people divorce over two to five percent and they ignore the 95 plus percent that they have in common because the enemy, the distorter, the divider, the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy turned our attention to the minor and we ignored the major. Let's just come back here and remember what makes us a people. This is what makes us a people. I'm going to read the scripture and we're going to pray. Look at this through koinonia now. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not that bre the bread that we break a participation? Are you seeing the participation? This isn't about just sitting back spectating something else. You're saying, I'm in and I'm willing to get intimate in my participation. I'm not gonna sit back and wait for you to do something God's calling me to do. How about we do it together? This is where it starts. It's participation in the body of Christ. Watch this, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all share the one loaf. Here's the koinonia. Let's get back to the communion moment of not just what it means for us individually, but what it means for us as a body. Keep it in the packet. I wanna bless with you the bread and the cup and we're gonna do something after, so don't partake yet. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless this bread. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless this cup. This bread represents your broken body, which is shared with many and the many can become one because of the one body that you have called us to and equipped us to be. Bless your blood, which is shed for many, because from that one body comes one blood that empowers us and unites us to be a people. Bless your blood and the symbols of your body and blood today in Jesus' name. Let's pray one more part of this prayer. Father, I'm tired of running and doing it on my own. I surrender to what you say about me. I surrender to what you have done for me. Heavenly Father, I surrender to you and I put my trust in you. If you've prayed this a thousand times or the first time, I want you to pray that salvation prayer here at communion. I surrender to what you've done for me. I declare you as my Lord, my Savior, and my King. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now, this might get a little uh, tricky logistically, but I want you to take that packet, and if you have a spouse or a family member or a friend, I want you to exchange with them because you are serving. You are serving the body and the blood to others. That act, and I know if for some reason it just doesn't work, it's okay. If you're just by yourself, it's all right. But endeavor to exchange. And you are demonstrating what it means to serve each other with koinonia. Let's partake. Father, make us one. Can you pray that? Make us one in your blood. Make us one in your bread. Make us one in your body. We are your people and we surrender to you.
If you've partaken and you're in a good place, I want you to stand with me if you can. I'm going to step away from this pulpit, but could you do something with me right now? Just put your hand on the shoulder of the person beside you and say, this is my family. And I want you to pray for them right now. Pray for their their healing. Pray for their strength. Pray for their blessing. Pray for their connection. Bless them. I bless you in the name that is above every name. I pray that your body reflects the reality of heaven. I pray that you realize you are not alone right now. You are a part of me and we are a part of each other. Jesus, draw us close in your name. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name. God bless you today. My name is Pastor John Mark and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.